Good evening, Woodstock Church of Christ. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of your summer series this year. In case you are unf unfamiliar with me, my name is Kyle Rye, and I am the pulpit minister at the Buford Church of Christ. Uh, this is my third uh, summer to be a part of your program, and I am uh, deeply grateful to Brother Amos and the elders for inviting me to be a part of it again. And of course, I, I'm saddened that we can't be together in person, but, but grateful we can still study. And I, it is my prayer that our, our time of study will be beneficial for all involved. As you know, uh, we're going to be studying about the works of the flesh tonight as we continue this, this great study that you have going this summer. And I'd like to read that passage with you as we get started. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. We'll, we'll read it and then turn our attention to the specific words that we'll be focused on this evening. So please open your Bibles and read with me Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19 and going through verse 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now the two words we're going to focus on this evening are the last word in verse 20 and the first word in verse 21. In the New King James Version, those words are heresies and envy. And tonight we're going to start off by looking at the first of these words. We're going to look at heresies. Really, what is Paul talking about when he says heresies. Well, the Greek term translated heresies refers to a body of men following their own tenets, such as a sect or a party. It can also refer to dissensions that, that arise from the diversity of opinions and aims within a particular group. Now, both of those definitions are provided by Thayer's Greek-English lexicon. But I think really understanding what heresies is referring to is aided by looking at how it's translated in our English Bibles. You see, the term heresies appears nine different times in the New Testament. Six of those appearances are in the book of Acts. And in every case that is mentioned in the book of Acts, that's Acts chapter 5 and verse 17, Acts chapter 15 and verse 5, Acts chapter 24 and verse 5, Acts chapter 24 and verse 14, Acts chapter 26 and verse 5, and Acts chapter 28 and verse 22. In every case that this term appears in the book of Acts, it is translated as either sect or party. This term also appears in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19, where it is translated as heresies in the King James Version, factions in the New King James Version, the English Standard Version, and the New American Standard Version, and differences in the New International Version. This term also appears in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, where it's translated by all major English translations simply as heresies. And then, of course, it appears here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20, where the most diversity of translations seems to be had. The King James Version, the New King James Version, translated here as heresies. But if you look at the English Standard Version, it uses the word divisions. And if you look at the New American Standard Version and the New International Version, they translate it here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20 as factions. Ultimately, what I want you to gain about this word right now is that the term heresies really refers to errant teaching that is driven by a particular individual or group's self-interest and as a result creates division in the church. Now, now that we've kind of established the meaning of this word, at least what it's referring to and to some degree, I want us to really think about the negative impact on the Christian. Obviously, here in the works of the flesh, these are identified as practices that will prevent you from inheriting the kingdom of God. But why? Some of these are self-evident as to why they would prevent you from inheriting the kingdom of God. But what here about heresies in particular is so wrong? Well, there's two things I want you to gain tonight about this term heresies. First, I want you to understand that heresies compromise unity. Heresies compromise unity. See, one thing I find interesting about the Greek term that's being translated here is that when it was employed in reference to Jewish sects, 
such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it didn't carry a negative connotation. Apparently, it was appropriate to apply this term to the various religious parties within Judaism. Paul even utilized it in that context. If you go to Acts chapter 26 and verse 5, Paul is uh, uh, sharing his testimony with Agrippa. And he acknowledged to Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 and verse 5 that he was a Pharisee, and he referred to it as the strictest party of our religion. So when Paul reflected on his own status as a Pharisee, he admitted that it was a sect or a party within Judaism. But when this term got applied to the church, Paul took offense to it. This is apparent in Acts chapter 24, when Paul stood trial before Felix the governor in Caesarea. If you go to Acts chapter 24 and verse 5, you'll see that the Jewish, Jewish leaders accused Paul of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. A ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, Paul's response to this accusation was to correct their terminology. So if you skip down in Acts chapter 24 to verse 14, you'll see that he identified the church not as the sect of the Nazarenes, but as the way. And then he told Felix that the Jewish leaders, that they call the way a sect. And by implication, what he was saying is that I don't call it that. I don't consider it to be a sect. In other words, he considered this term her that's translated heresies or sect, he considered it an inappropriate term for God's church. Now, why was Paul okay with using this term to refer to di different Jewish groups, but not the church? Because a sect by implication means that you are one of multiple acceptable branches or denominations of a larger spiritual community. So when the Jewish leaders referred to the Nazarenes as a sect, they were by implication saying that the church was just another variation of Judaism, which in their minds was the only acceptable religion in the eyes of God. So Paul's clarification here in Acts chapter 24 and verse 14 was necessary because the church was not another branch of Judaism. It was and is the way. Because as Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that means no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, Paul was disassociating the way from Judaism because the Jews had rejected the Messiahship of Jesus and the only way to be numbered among God's chosen people moving forward was to confess that Jesus Christ was the risen Son of God and follow Him. So what does all of this have to do with unity? Why is it so important to make a connection to unity here as we talk about heresies? Well, as we've seen, heresies are associated with sects or parties. They're associated with these different groups within a larger community of faith. And when you look at what Jesus had to say about the church, he opposed any such divisions or denominations. Consider for a moment Jesus' prayer. John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In this passage, Jesus prayed for his disciples, current disciples and future disciples, to all be one. That's a prayer for unity between brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus also prayed for his disciples, both current and future, to be in us, he said, to be in him and his Father. That's a prayer for unity between believers in God. So in one of his final recorded prayers before his death, Jesus prayed for believers to be unified with each other and to be unified with God. And the implication then is that there is one united people of God who are united with His will. And so there can't be separate groups. There can't be sects or parties or denominations. 
Why did Jesus pray for those two things? Because if you look at verse 21 of John chapter 7, John chapter 17, he prayed for unity on those two fronts so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, unity between disciples and unity with God apparently serves as evidence for the deity of Christ. There's only one body. There's only one way. And so there can't be heresies. There can't be these different groups and different denominations because Jesus indicated that the way the world's going to know that we are, that we are, uh, or excuse me, that He is the Son of God is through our unity, through our oneness, through the fact that we lack heresies. See, love may be the trait that will declare to the world that we're followers of Jesus, but unity is the trait that will declare to the world that He is the Christ. And that's why unity is so important, and that's why heresies, which compromise such unity, are so dangerous and therefore identified as works of the flesh. But see, heresies don't just compromise unity. They also compromise truth. I want you to look at what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 in the first three verses. So turn in your Bibles, 2 Peter chapter 2, and look with me at the first three verses of that chapter. Because Peter's going to address heresies. In fact, I noted earlier that 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 is one of the passages, one of the nine times that the word we read here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20 appears. And so in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Peter says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Here Peter associated heresies with false teaching. Very clearly associated with false teaching. He says false prophets arose among the people, and there will be false teachers who rise up among you, and this is what they're going to bring. They're going to bring destructive heresies. And in his day and time, he indicated that, that the false teaching was so egregious that it denounced the divinity of Christ. So Paul's saying that heresies will, will come into the church via false teachers, and they can be very blatant false teachings. See, one thing is clear throughout the New Testament, and that is that false teaching is not to be tolerated. That's the whole point that Peter's making here. Don't listen to the false teachers. Don't get caught up in, in following the false teachers. Think about it. when Paul met with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he instructed them to watch over the flock because men will rise up speaking perverse things that draw away the disciples after themselves. That's a warning that Paul gave way back in Acts chapter 20. And then Paul wrote to Timothy multiple times, warning about false teaching. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, he told Timothy and instructed Timothy to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, he instructed Timothy to preach the word because the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will, but will ultimately find teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear, and as a result, they will turn away from the truth. You can even think about 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, where, where Paul warns against false teaching. He says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit, understands nothing, he has unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Paul had a lot of warnings against false teaching. And when, you, and when you look at Christ's letters to the churches in Pergamum and Thyatira, as recorded in Revelation chapters 2, 
what you'll see is him criticizing those ch churches for tolerating false teaching. It appears that those two congregations in particular were emphasizing love to the exclusion of truth. They apparently determined that it was more important to, to love everyone than to take a stand for the truth. And as a result, their, their love really had no standards or boundaries. And you think is that's not really loving to tolerate ideas and behaviors and attitudes that are incongruent with the will of God. And so you have this instruction from Paul that also appears, that appears in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 to speak the truth in love. Not to be silent on truth because of love, but to speak the truth in love. You see, there's this expectation all throughout the New Testament that truth is going to triumph, that truth is just that important. And the problem with heresies, the reason they are a danger to the Christian, the reason heresies will prevent you from inheriting the kingdom of God is because they're compromising truth and they're compromising unity. So heresies are categorically among the works of the flesh because they are incongruent with God's will and God's expectations. But we have a second word that appears here in the text. Heresies isn't our only focus this evening. We also have this term translated envy. Now, in a modern English dictionary, envy is defined as a feeling of discontent or covetousness with regard to another's advantages, success, possessions, etc. Now, that sounds a lot like jealousy, doesn't it? And you may have noticed that jealousy has already been identified as a work of the flesh earlier in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20. And oftentimes we associate jealousy and envy with one another. In fact, there is at least one occasion in the New Testament where the term that's translated envy here is translated jealousy in most English translations. That's James chapter 4 and verse 5. But there is ultimately a difference between envy and jealousy. And that is the fact that jealousy is a neutral term. Jealousy can have a positive connotation or a negative connotation. For example, God is often referred to or described as jealous. That's not a bad characteristic. That's not an evil characteristic. That is not a negative characteristic. God's jealousy is for His righteousness. And so God can be a jealous God as He is uh, upholding truth. He's upholding righteousness and He's upholding holiness and so on. So jealousy is not in and of itself a negative quality, but envy is. Envy always has a negative connotation in biblical Greek, as one author said. In fact, one commentator noted that the term translated envy here differs from jealousy in that it expresses an attitude of self-interest to such a degree that it seeks to harm another person. Now, let me repeat that because I'm going to be using it again, again later as we talk about envy. But here's what one commentator said. Envy is an attitude of self-interest to such a degree that it seeks to harm another person. If you really look at how this particular term is used throughout the New Testament, you kind of get that picture. For instance, it's in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 18, as well as Mark chapter 15 and verse 10, where this same word translated envy appears, and we're told that Pilate knew that it was out of envy that the Sanhedrin had delivered Jesus up to him. He knew that, the, that in their envy they were trying to bring harm to Jesus. And then you go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 29, this word translated envy is there. And we're told that those on whom the wrath of God is to be revealed, according to verse 18, that they are they're described throughout the, end of the rest of the chapter. And if you skip down to verse 29 of Romans chapter 1, we're told that they're filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. And then it goes on to say they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, it's interesting to me because envy is categorized in there among other, among other harmful words like murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. It's an indication to us that envy 
does seek harm. Finally, I, want, I think about Philippians chapter 1, where, where Paul uh, is writing from this Roman prison, and he indicates that his imprisonment has emboldened some of the Christians in Rome to speak the word without fear. That's what he says in verse 13. If you go to verses 15 through 17 of Philippians chapter 1, you'll see that Paul clarified that not everyone who was emboldened to speak were doing it for the right reason. So he says this, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Now, what does he mean when he says some preach Christ from envy? Well, unfortunately, some of the Christians in Rome, for reasons that we don't necessarily know, they, they didn't like Paul. And so they preached with the purpose of distressing Paul. They may have thought that by preaching Christ, they would have antagonized the Roman authorities against Paul. Or maybe they thought they would make Paul jealous. Maybe they thought that their evangelistic success would create within him a sense of jealousy that he wasn't being as productive as as them. Maybe they were vying to become a, a greater authority than him. We don't know the reason that they wanted to distress Paul or how they were distressing Paul. But that was their aim. They preached Christ out of envy because they wanted it to hurt Paul in some capacity. Of course, Paul says it didn't. He was just grateful that the Word of God was being proclaimed. I share those passages with you for us to realize that that envy produces a harmful intent behind it. And the important thing for us to realize about envy is that it is an unacceptable trait for citizens of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, envy is one of those characteristics that must be put away when one becomes a child of God. Peter made that perfectly clear in 1 Peter 2 and verse 1 where he called on Christians to put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Peter made it clear that that if you're going to be a child of God, you got to get rid of the envy. And then in Titus chapter 3, Paul identified envy as one of the traits that we might have possessed prior to receiving salvation. But he implies in that passage that it's a characteristic unbefitting of someone who has been regenerated, renewed, and justified by God's grace through Jesus. And so in Titus chapter 3 and verses 3 through 7, you get this picture that, hey, you may have uh, possessed envy before you became a child of God, but now that you are a child of God, it doesn't fit in the picture anymore. So when we talk about envy, we're talking about a characteristic that can't be part of the Christian repertoire. Now that we kind of have an idea of what this word is referring to and what scripture has to say about it. Let's consider its negative impact on the Christian like we did heresies. What makes it a work of the flesh? Why is it a trait that would prevent one from inheriting the kingdom of God? Well, for one, I think it's because envy negates humility. Envy negates humility. I want you to see what James said. James chapter 3 verses 13 through 17. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. He'll refer to envy in two of the uh, the verses that appear in this section. James chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Here's what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, some translations will use the word jealousy, but the New King James uses bitter envy. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, there's two things I want you to notice in this text. First, I want you to notice that envy and a self-seeking attitude are grouped together. Earlier, I provided one commentator's definition of envy, which was an attitude of self-interest to such a degree that it seeks to harm another person. An attitude of self-interest. 
And the point is that envy is unrighteous because it is focused on the self rather than others. It is selfish. The second thing I want you to notice here of what James is saying, I want you to notice that the characteristics of envy and a self-seeking attitude are set in contrast to the characteristics of peacemaking, of gentleness, of submission, and of mercy. And James says that one set of these characteristics comes from the world, and the other set of these characteristics comes from heaven. The point is that envy is unrighteous because it's worldly. It's focused on what the world thinks about you instead of what God thinks about you. And when I consider these two points, that envy is unrighteous because it's focused on the self rather than others, and that envy is unrighteous because it's focused on what the world thinks about you instead of what God thinks about you, it reminds me of a parable Jesus told. The parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. As the parable goes, there's a Pharisee who went to the temple to pray. And just listen to how he prayed. Listen to the words he prayed in verses 11 and 12 of Luke 18. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. That prayer is fascinating to me. Because that that Pharisee didn't praise God for anything. He didn't ask God for guidance. He didn't seek God's will. In fact, his prayer wasn't about God at all. It was about himself and how great he is. And did you notice his prayer is not even directed to God? It was directed to the people that could hear him, people that were there and, and, and would hear the words he's praying because it's, it's vocal. It's intentional to be heard. What was that Pharisee doing? In his arrogance, he was announcing how much better than other men he is. He was absolutely 100% self-absorbed. And I'm certain that self-absorbed, that that particular self-absorption, that it grew out of envy. I bet there were other people better than him. So he had to find someone that he could compare himself to and declare that he's better than that person. See, here's the thing. In doing that, that Pharisee demonstrated no concern for anyone other than himself. And that includes God. Meanwhile, you've got the tax collector over there refusing to look in God's general direction, beating his chest and pleading for God's mercy. What was he doing? He wasn't comparing himself to any other person. He was comparing himself to God and realizing that he was undeserving of God's grace because he was a sinner. You see, the envy that was eating up that Pharisee because he was part of this mindset of being better than others. That envy negatively impacted his relationship with God because it was all about him. He was so self-absorbed that he didn't see God. And who did Jesus say went away justified in that parable? Was it the self-absorbed Pharisee? Or was it the self-abased tax collector? You see, envy is a problem because it keeps our attention on ourselves instead of God, and it keeps our attention on ourselves instead of others, and that breaks the greatest command. And with that, we come to the second problem with envy. We've already said that envy negates humility, but maybe more important than that, envy negates love. Look at Paul's definition of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want you to notice what he said love is and is not. Love is patient and kind, beginning in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. What Paul is saying is that love and envy are incompatible. And the reason is because envy, as I mentioned earlier, 
is an attitude of self-interest to such a degree that it seeks to harm another person. See, we understand that love is a required attribute of a disciple. In fact, Jesus indicated in John chapter 13 and verse 35 that love will be the defining attribute of a disciple. He said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But the one thing we sometimes do with love is relegate it to an emotion or an action. But I think scripture broadens love to include intention. In other words, the Bible speaks of love not just as something you feel or something you do, but as a mindset you possess. Let's consider another parable right now. The parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Jesus told that parable in response to a question about love. He was discussing the greatest command with someone. And if you look at Luke chapter 10, verse 27, the greatest command is summarized. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus tells this parable in which a Samaritan man models love of his neighbor by feeling compassion for the injured man, by actively demonstrating his love and helping him, and by possessing an unbiased mindset that only wants the best for that man. You see, when Jesus talked about the greatest command here using this parable, particularly the love thy neighbor portion, he indicated that the greatest command implies intentional goodness felt, thought, and shown towards, our, or, uh, and towards others. I think the point is this, that Jesus indicated in the parable of the Good Samaritan that loving others means actively and intentionally intentionally seeking to do good to and for them. I think Paul understood that. And that's why if you look at Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, he references loving one another as the fulfillment of the law. And then he followed that up by saying in Romans chapter 13 and verse 10, that love does no wrong to a neighbor. See, love isn't just about feeling the right thing, and doing the right thing. It's also about having the right intentions. It's not love if my intentions are not right. And that's why envy is all wrong. Because envy is this desire, not just for the betterment of yourself, but for the harm of someone else. And that's not love. So when we look here at this term translated envy, what we see is a a concept, a, a, a mindset that is not humble and that is not loving. And for those reasons, it's unbefitting of a Christian. It is a, a characteristic that will prevent you from inheriting the kingdom of God. So whether we're talking about heresies or envy, we're talking about traits that will prevent you from kingdom inheritance. We're talking about traits that are inconsistent with the will of God. And let me close with this. It's a story I heard about a man who went to a city hoping to save that city from God's judgment. And so he tried talking to first one individual and then the next going door to door, but but nobody would engage him in conversation. So then he decided to try carrying a a picket sign that had the word repent written on it in large letters and, and a couple of verses noted on it, but nobody paid any attention to his sign after an initial glance. Finally, he decided that he would start going from street to street, from marketplace to marketplace, just shouting at the top of his lungs, Men and women, repent! What you're doing is wrong! It will destroy you! And people just laughed at him, but he kept shouting. One day, a person stopped him and said, Stranger, can't you see that what you're doing is useless? Why keep shouting? The man replied, Yeah, I can see that it's not doing much good. But when I arrived in this city, I was convinced that I could change it. Now I continue shouting because I don't want the city to change me. And here's the point that I want to make based on that little story. 
point is that the world will continue to allow heresies and envy to thrive. Because the world doesn't operate on the same value system as us. But we can't let ourselves be influenced by the world. Instead, we must operate based on a different value system, a heavenly value system that emphasizes unity and trust, uh, truth and humility and love. So we don't pursue the works of the flesh because we're not citizens of the world first. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven And that inheritance tells us that we strive for something different. And so when we consider the works of the flesh today, remember that heresies will compromise unity and truth. And remember that envy will negate humility and love. And all four of those are traits that are upheld in the kingdom of heaven, so they must be upheld in our lives today. Will you go to God in prayer with me? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to study your word. We're thankful that you have uh, given us this list of these traits that we need to say no to. Lord, we ask tonight as we study the works of the flesh that you will help us to refrain from getting caught up in any type of heresy, any any kind of mindset that causes dissensions and, and that affects unity in a negative light, that we never get caught up in any false teaching, promoting it, or listening to it. Lord, it is our prayer that you will help us to uh, ensure that envy never becomes a part of our lives, that we never lack the humility you expect of us, that we never hesitate to love according to the standard you have set for us, that we won't let envy invade. And Lord, we pray that in so doing, we can be a light to the world around us, never being changed by the world, but striving to be a change in the world. Lord, thank you for sending your son to die for us so that our sins can be paid for. Help us to live in a way that honors that sacrifice and help us all, Lord, to demonstrate our love for you in everything that we do. Lord, it is through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we offer this prayer. Amen.